Karen, nice to meet you. Guys, why don't you sit down there because uh, Tim uh, runs, uh, works for a German magazine. Tell them what you do. Uh, so I am a, a Wall Street correspondent and I work for several publications. It's a, it's a conglomerate, so they have um, Axel Springer is behind, actually. Uh -huh. It's Financen.net and several uh, magazines and websites. And these are three individuals that are in college. Oh, okay. Not the gymnasium, but in college. And uh, they are here for the summer, so just in case oh, okay. you have some interesting questions. You will ask interesting questions, and in case you need any, any feedback, they'll, they'll get sure. you the answers, okay? Okay. Let's what, do it. What makes a great value investor? What, what are the criteria you would say are necessary or character? What, what do you need to be a great value guy? Well, I think one of the elements is patience. Secondly, you do have to understand that when we buy shares of stock, we're buying a piece of a business. So what is the business worth? From my point of view, I had an accounting background and a philosophy minor, but then when I went into graduate school, I had finance, but in particular security analysis. So I was trained in the Graham and Dodd methodology of valuing a security. You gather the data, that is, you look at all the public information. You, then we, as a firm, put it together by arraying it. Then we project, then we interpret, and then we communicate. So we call it the GAPIC, GAPIC approach, G-A-P-I-C approach to investing. So we try to find companies. Now back about, Tim, about 70, 80 years ago, you would try to find a company where you had a million shares outstanding, selling at $10, but they had cash or receivables of $12. It was basically finding a company below, in the public markets, below the net current value of their assets. That is very hard to do today. The markets have been reasonably culled over. So you then try to find other businesses where uh, you do this work the second thing that's important other than patience is accumulating knowledge of industries over an extended period of time. So by following the auto industry as I've done for 40 years or 50 years and the farm equipment industry and the entertainment business, you can adopt the change quicker and if the, the stock market, which we call Mr. Market, mm -hmm. comes down as it did on Friday and today it's because of Brexit you can see what, what companies make an interesting opportunity, are they weak enough, and then how much time do you have to hold. So those are kind of the elements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, today, if, even if you find something below book value, mostly, even if there's a gap of 20%, it's hard to make that 20% then, right? It's, it's liquidating a company or like wait it out, there is a yes. reason, right? Well, there's, uh, there are elements. So what we call the private market value with a catalyst, because we would like to harvest and narrow the spread between the public price of a security, what you can buy a company at, and what it would sell to a private equity and or a strategic that is a corporate buyer. So in that framework, we don't necessarily look at book value. We look at what we call what multiple of cash flow minus capital expenditures, EBITDA minus capital expenditures, would someone pay to own the business? How quickly will that EBITDA grow? How is it infected by inflation, deflation? Is it subscription revenues or is it a transaction revenue? For example, if you're buying sugar, and there's a spike in the price of sugar, somebody's going to make a lot of money, but what multiple would you pay for that as opposed to someone that's buying a cable television uh, cash flow? So that we distinguish that between book value and what the value of business is, and that value can change over time. For example, if you're doing leveraged buyouts, private equity, what multiple can you sell the business at five years from now? How, what kind of return do you want to have on your equity investment? How much debt do you can you do you can you raise to finance it today, and how much debt can you raise when you want to sell it to somebody else who'll do the same thing? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of uh, dots. Not complicated, but that's what we do. Sure. And you mentioned a patient. You have to be patient. Well, what is your time horizon when you buy today a stock? Well. When you look at the Gabelli portfolios, and we run forty billion dollars U.S. all equities. 
Pine Valley in rough numbers. Our turnover is about 10%, which means we hold stocks for 10 years. So as a result of that, we have a very long-term time frame. However, when we start the process, what we like to do, and this is about what we do most of the time, but not all the time, you basically say, okay, if the stock is selling, in a case of Scripps Broadcasting at $16, the symbol is SSP, we think it's worth $22 today or $24. What will it be worth in three or four years? How do I, what elements would be visible to the world that would say, okay, that $16 will go higher and match the private market value? Then we ask ourselves, what can go wrong? Where can we make a mistake in the analysis of private market value? And then where could we be wrong, not only because it can go down, but maybe because it can go up higher? So we look at those facets of the valuation process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what, what is the company? What is behind? What is the story? Why do you like it? And oh, this particular company, is. The, I started following the broadcast industry 50 years ago. Mm -hmm and they were tied to the growth of consumer spending. So if you are a company like Procter & Gamble, or a company like Unilever, or a company like Rentkeiser, if your revenues are growing and your profits are growing because the consumer sector of the economy is growing, and the consumer sector of the economy grows not only in real terms, but also in nominal terms because the products they sell tend to have administered pricing where they do reasonably well in inflationary times. Their advertising budgets will grow. So the broadcasters had a sense of being inflation indexed and they did not have a large amount of capital expenditures. In this particular case, this company located in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, bought another TV station operator and sold all their newspapers to that TV station operator. So there are approximately 80 odd million shares the stock is $16, the symbol is SSP, so 16 times 80 is about $1.2 billion. They have about $400 million of debt, so you add the debt to the company and then you look at how much cash flow. And how much will they do in 2016 where you have some unusual events, the Olympics most likely, the presidential election in the United States where there's some people advertise, and then the sale of Spectrum. So as a result of that, we think uh, the use of cash flow to buy back stock, we think uh, all of those elements will come together to, su to support the stock here in the, in the mid-teens. So our downside, I think, is somewhat limited. And then we look at how much can we make on the upside. Mm -hmm. Do they also have internet uh, portals and websites? No, or? they don't, but they have inching into that area. And they also have in a scale in terms of uh, creating their own content at the local station level, but this is not a large television station operator. Mm -hmm. The largest ones would have a footprint on the, there's 330 million people in the United States, about 120 million households, and they measure them by households, and to the degree the largest TV broadcasters in the United States are Scripps, and a next door uh, that are publicly traded cha station owners would own about 38% uh, of that footprint. This one is a small piece of that. Because long term they say that the view, uh, TV uh, viewing goes down. Yes. And TV and streaming yes. and Netflix goes Over the up. top, yeah. net streaming, but, uh, yeah. whatever portable mobile devices. YouTube and... YouTube and yeah, yes. Those and then what happens is that the uh, advertiser needs to figure out a way to get a message targeted to a specific group. There's no reason to show me an ad for a car if I'm not interested in buying a car. Yes. Okay, or if I'm 12 years old and I want to buy cereal, uh, I love cars, but uh, my, my market is uh, for a Ferrari is a long way off or a BMW. Yeah. So, but with Facebook and so on, you can better market it, right? Even yes, you can target news. marketing, yeah. right. It's much like you're doing with your subscribers. Also, the attention span mm -hmm. in the digital generation is two minutes to three minutes, and that's what you'd like to keep everything at. Yeah. Okay, and um, is there another stock you like? Uh, well, there are many. Let's mm -hmm. deal with another one that uh, we like financial engineering. So when interest rates have come down, and as interest rates come down, there are investors in the world. There's 60 odd trillion dollars in the equity markets and about 90 to 100 trillion dollars of fixed income. But investors in the United States are about 30% of that market 
they want to get current return. If you're in Germany, you're getting a negative return. If you're in Japan, you're not getting it. You're getting a negative return. So how do we get current return? One of the areas that has worked well for us, and we've been in it for 15 years, is the utility industry. But we don't want utilities because they pay a nice dividend that's growing. We want them because there's a consolidation going on in the industry. Just in the year 2016, about seven or eight companies have been taken over. So one of the companies that we like is located in the southwestern part of the United States called Public New Mexico. Uh, it is a company that operates in the utility area, but is positioned to merge with the El Paso Electric and or another company in that area. So the three of them we think will combine. And there's been about seven or eight utility companies. So we got a nice dividend that's growing, well-managed company, geographically good part of the world. And uh, so that's an example. And the ticker symbol is? PNM, Peter Nancy Mario. Okay. And, um, but, but, but those stocks, they grow slowly. You yes. can see, do you say the phrase that you can watch the grass growing like very slowly, but it's very stable then it's too. It's like right? turtles racing. Yeah. But to the degree that they are tied with interest rates, so if interest rates go up. So the question is, what do you want to own if inflation goes up? You do not necessarily want to own utilities. And the reason for that is that the utilities have a rate of return that's regulated. And so when inflation picks up, the regulators are unlikely to increase your allowable rate of return. So if you can make 10% a year in inflation too, that's 8% real, this is good. If inflation is uh, going to go from 2% to 8% and the stock is priced as though it was only going to stay at 2 that is not good. So those are the elements that one has to wait in. Now in, in the distribution of things, the distributor, if they can grow real unit volume at 2% and have 2% nominal inflation, that's 4% assuming they don't gain share and everything else is constant. But their SG&A expenses can grow at 3 or 4%, so they don't have any leverage. Even though they maintain gross margin, there's not that much leverage on the SG&A. But if inflation picks up and inflation goes from 2 to 3%, the revenue stream grows by 5. If margins are constant, the gross margin grows by 5, but if SG&A only grows 3 or 4 because they have good controls, then what happens is that they have leverage and operating at profit. So we look at companies that can benefit from an increase in inflation. One of those sectors in the United States is parts for cars, replacement parts. If you look at the world, there's one billion cars on the road in the world. If you look at production in the year 2016, it's about 100 million. The United States is about 16 to 17 million of the production. Japan is only about seven or eight. Europe is about 18. China is about 23 and so on. And uh, there's 300 and 250 million cars in the United States, and they need parts, and they're getting older. So that companies like Genuine Parts, the symbol is GPC, located in Atlanta, Georgia. There are 150 million shares. The stock is selling at approximately uh, $95. They've raised the dividend every year for the last 50 years. They would be a prime beneficiary. Earnings this year are about 460, and they can grow over the next several years. I'm going to get some water. Would you like anything? Let's take I'm a break. break. <clears throat> All right. Um, and I gave you some other names that are there, but I don't have it in front of me. And the P.E. ratio of uh, GPC? Genuine parts, unfortunately, is about 20 times. That's, so, that's okay with you, then? Uh, it's not on the cheap side, okay? But it is a basically a company that has an advantage. Uh, it's not going to be taken over. And the advantage that in terms of the company is that they have made acquisitions in New Zealand and Australia and the currencies in those markets have dropped sharply in part because of the Chinese export dynamic. The second part is they have the similar type of dynamics in Canada. So that will hopefully stabilize and allow the earnings to grow at a faster rate because they've acted as a headwind. The second part is that in addition to automotive, they do about 15 billion of revenues. They do about 10 billion of that as automotive. But they do about uh, several billion dollars where they sell parts for industrial equipment. And the United States economy has been hurt because of the strong dollar 
as a result, they can't export as much. So manufacturing is not as buoyant. They don't need as many parts. And then the oil sector in the United States is hurting. And I think that stabilizes over the next couple of years. They're a full U.S. cash taxpayer for tax purposes. So if the United States reduces their corporate tax rate from 35% to a lower rate, they benefit. So there are a lot of moving parts. Why would nobody take them over? Is it too large or is it family? No, behind? I think it's not that. It's culturally, you just extraordinarily well managed and therefore you don't want to disrupt the, 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 uh, the only company that I think would be, would keep the culture would be a genuine, uh, a Berkshire Hathaway buying them. But I don't think uh, the companies are, are going to be taken over. Secondly, uh, and their debt, by the way, is tiny. It's only like $500 million versus their billion plus of EBITDA. And CapEx is tiny, only $100 million. And this year will probably be a little more because they're building some distribution centers. In addition to that, they have a logistics business that's very good. So if you want to pick, pack, and sort and distribute the way Amazon does, that this company has that core competency. And then it's an aristocrat. That sounds very good, right? Yes, it's been a very good stock. We started following the company in 1967. So I've been covering it for almost 50 years, and um, I visit them religiously by going to Atlanta, Georgia, and seeing the management, and they uh, have a new CEO that has come on board, uh, and uh, this is probably the fifth one in their 80-year history. How do you like Amazon? You mentioned it with logistics. It's, I think you bought it. Uh, well, we don't own any Amazon. And our, well, we've owned it for a while, but we haven't bought any in the last five years. And uh, Jeff Bezos has done a terrific job. His AWS, which is the cloud services that he provides, along with the distribution. It's interesting and one that we have to follow because of the amount of packages that people order, Amazon Prime deliver, you know, uh, why go shopping when you can have it delivered, do everything on a digital world, this is the digital generation, so as a result of that, this digital generation wants everything delivered. Okay. And that means that, if, for example, if you live in an apartment complex in New York at Christmas time, your super is going to have lots of problems. Yeah. And so we're looking for companies that create uh, storage facilities for example, if you are across the street, there's the Osborne House. If packages are delivered, they will have locations in which they will put a code on the box so that if Amazon comes in at 12 o'clock at night to deliver through a delivery service, you can tap into that code, open the box, put it in there. The next day, that code changes. Mm -hmm. So I can pick up my delivery anytime during the day. The delivery service doesn't have to go through my doorman. Uh, so the world is changing. It's interesting. And Amazon is a, a creature and driver of that change. Mm -hmm. And it may be interesting for you to pick more up or it, it's... Uh... It's not at the moment. Okay. Okay, Jeff B, the market cap is $400 billion yeah. or $300 billion along with, uh, you know, some of the other FANG stocks. What do you think about Netflix? Because you have a lot of uh, traditional media like Viacom, CBS? Yes, well, uh, CBS does have some over the top with uh, CBS Now and all of the companies like uh, Time Warner has created Hulu. Yeah. Traditionally, we've liked the content companies. And what we like is recurring revenues. So Netflix, we think, is a bargain at $9.95 or $10.95, depending on what part of the world and when you came in. So with their subscribers growing, that company has a, a significant pricing flexibility. However, one has to be, as they would say in the old Greek mythology, the Achilles heel of Netflix. Right now, they distribute their product for free because the cable operator has to carry it. At some point in time, there will be a new administration in the United States. There will be a new head of the Federal Communications Commission. And the individuals at Google and Netflix and Apple that have been getting free carriage, they may have to wind up paying to get their traffic. So if everyone in my building is watching Netflix, they may need more capacity and they may have to pay for that. Secondly, the other operators are getting together and trying to do that, but they have a first mover advantage. They offer good, a good price. Uh, good service for the price. So Netflix is intriguing. Again, it's a question of what price in the market am I paying for that growth rate? And we're not adding to the portfolios on this at this time. What's your take on Google or Alphabet? No, I, well, those are large companies. Let me give you an example of what is going on in the United States. Gasoline stations. 
because of environmental rules, gasoline stations cannot relocate. The ones that are existing have gone out of business, so that, and then the stores that sold you gasoline have created locations where if you go up and get your gasoline, you also stop in the store and you can buy uh, Gatorade, you can buy uh, your cigarettes for those that smoke, you can buy a bunch of things. Those stocks were not public, but Kush Latard in Montreal, 7-Eleven in Japan were public, but nobody kind of clustered them. Then you had a company in the Midwestern part of the United States called Casey's. But today there are three or four others. And so there's a nice group of companies that you can follow, good growth rates. So we are focusing on a company located in San Antonio, Texas, called CST. It was spun off from Valero. The symbol is CST. The stock is $40. There are 77 million shares outstanding. And they just announced that they're looking at, in quotes, strategic alternatives, which means to me that they'll probably sell the company. So we think they can get anywhere from $48 to $60. We've owned it now since they were spun off from Solero. The, uh, Kim LaBelle, the woman that runs this, the CEO, is doing a good job. And so I think they'll allow that value to surface. The, the category is interesting. And as you will read in the papers for this 4th of July weekend in the United States, there are more cars on the road driving more miles. And as a result of that, even with gasoline prices going up in the last two or three months, they're still well below where they were. So that you, uh, and once you drive cars, you're going to need parts, but you'll also get a gas and you'll fill up. Sure. How do you like oil after the drop, drastic drop? I think 50% or so. Yeah, well, you know, when it was a, uh, what we call in the United States was Thanksgiving Day of 2014, when the Saudis decided that they were going to maintain production. And as a result of that, by maintaining production, it didn't take much. So we as a world produce about 93 billion barrels. We're now consuming about 94 billion barrels. Russia is about 11 or 12 billion. Saudi Arabia is around 11 billion. So those are the, and then the United States was up to nine and a half, and that's slowly coming down. So you're getting back into balance. The price of oil has bounced back up from February lows of $25 to close to 46 today. They're down a couple of bucks in the last three, two days. And my sense is it probably will come down a little bit more short term after the driving season. But on balance, even with Iran coming on board with the problems in Nigeria maybe being resolved, Venezuela, but on supply and demand are in balance. So you take the American consumer. The American consumer consumes 20 billion uh, barrels a day, 20 million barrels a day. So even though the price has gone up relative to three years ago, it's $35 lower. That means they're still saving $700 million a day, and that money is going to be spent. So what we're doing is looking at where can you make money where your cash lifting cost is, and that would be in the United States, in the areas around uh, Texas and the Permian Basin. Uh, and uh, that, those companies, one of them is the symbol. Yeah. And, um And so they, they are stable, they are not in, a lot of companies get in trouble, right? They, they may not survive in, in the industry. Well, that's already been going on. You do have a consolidation as a result of either financial challenges or basically concerns over leverage. Now, a couple of years ago, we were buying a company uh, that uh, was bought by General Electric. We did not expect them Lufkin. Uh, we did not expect Schlumberger to go out and buy Cameron. Okay, the stock was at 60, we started buying it at 55, 52, 46, 40, and then we were waiting a little longer. They came in and paid in the mid-60s for the stock. So today there's a company called Weatherford, highly levered, almost a billion shares, the stock's five dollars, and they make equipment for pressure pumping, which is important for fracking. Uh, they make uh, equipment with regards to artificial lift, where you have to go in and help the product and the well completion. And so there are a lot of wells that have been drilled in the United States, but that have not been completed. So they get the benefit when oil prices stabilize and go up. So uh, there was a lot of opportunity in that area. Um, and in addition to that, where our core competency as a firm are, if you see anything on a device, whether it's your mobile, television, a PC, or a mo uh, tablet, we follow it. Whatever the contest, whatever the form of distribution, 
the second so cable companies around the world. Uh, we think there's going to be a consolidation again in Latin America of the cable operators. Uh, we had a big position in cable and wireless when it was taken over by Dr. John Malone of Denver. Uh, we, they own some uh, assets in Germany and so on. Vodafone with the, some short-term issues with regards to the pound because they're in the UK and a translation of earnings, but we think that one is kind of intriguing to us. There's a company controlled by a family out of Stockholm called Sh the Shinovic. The family is called Steinbeck. Christina Steinbeck, grandfather started it, she runs it. They own a company called Millicom, M-I-L-L-I-C-O-M. Millicom has assets at 100 million shares. The stock today is $53. They have assets in Africa, which they're selling except for Tanzania. They get their price. They will be left with assets in Latin America, primarily in uh, 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 Colombia, where there's about 55 million people. And then they're in Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, Port, uh, Panama. And that is kind of an intriguing area for both cable and television. So they will be consolidated by a company called Liberty Lilac. And that one will be attractive. I think it's worth probably $80 in the next two years. Um, in looking at Argentina, aside from the fact they lost to Chile uh, yesterday in soccer, uh, who is Germany playing, by the way? I don't know. Ah, come on. You've got to know the Euro. Yeah, come on, you guys know? Euro 2016? Uh, come on, Belgium is. Okay, you guys don't know. So, um, so that's uh, an interesting because of uh, Maurizio Macri is turning around Argentina. If you can turn around Brazil the same way you did, eventually Venezuela will turn around. Colombia is going to do better, and you go up in Panama and across that, and that uh, independent of what's going on in China. The other area is that if you drink something, we follow it: water, beer, soda. Okay. So I was in Milan not too long ago visiting a company called Campari. Campari was on, brought to my attention because we were doing and own all of the companies that make American bourbon. We felt that that was a good business. They bought a bourbon company about 10 years ago, and the stock is selling at about uh, 9 euros, and uh, we own 9 million shares of it. So it's a pretty well, large holders of this company, and they are in the process of buying Grand Marnier. We also like Pernod, which is based in Paris, Diageo in London. Now the stocks each one has a little challenge, in part because of China, in part because of the currency. But if you can make something in Europe, pay in local euros and sell in dollars, you're doing well today. If you make something in England or Scotland, like Scotch, okay, and you make it with local expenses and you get all dollars, that's a, an interesting, and particularly if the stocks go down. So um, the SAB Miller, the Heineken merger, Heineken is a beer company, uh, the uh, Ambev, uh, the companies that we like. And as a result, we go around the world and look at bottling companies, and uh, there are always changes in taste. One of them in the United States is called National Beverage, located in Boca Raton, Florida. They sell a product called LaCroix, which is apparently uh, a product that the millennials like, all natural ingredients, it's very attractive. And is there something in Great Britain after the the drop? Or? Yes, a lot. But one of them that I was right now on our radar screen is a company called BBA Aviation, located in the Mayfair district. And BBA Aviation I, operates the private jet locations called Signature. And they are buying. They bought another group called Landmark. The stock is selling at two pounds. Ninety percent of their earnings are outside the UK, so they get the reverse benefit of translation. They don't make anything in the UK but their operations in the United States are worth more. Mm -hmm. So since the stock trades in pounds and since the currency, as the stock has gone down with the market, uh, and the I'm buying it cheaper in pounds because the pound today is 131 while we're talking, but their earnings are gonna be worth more. So those are the kinds of opportunities. It was like Remy Martin in Paris where you buy cognac and you sell it around the world in, in local currency. Yeah. 
Well, what is your take on, on mining, like gold and silver is going up? Well, we own, uh, we have a well-run gold fund. I don't run it. Uh, okay. The guy that's running it is a Brit. Uh, he was a barrister, one of those legal guys that had the wig and the robe, and he sold both of those, and he's basically been with us for about 20 years. Okay. He's up close to 100% okay. this year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's very volatile returns, and the gold at 1320, to me, is a lot better store of value for some people that... Uh, are worried about economic and global turbulence a lot better than Bitcoin. Yeah. It's going to be very hard to go through the border with Bitcoins. Yeah. And uh, some personal questions. So you built up that business um, for, uh, by yourself, right? The, so how did you grow up? Was your family in finance or how did you get in touch with finance? And Oh, I, because I basically started caddying. Okay. Okay, so I made uh, $2 per bag per loop. So if I had doubles, which means two bags, you make four dollars. And the advantage was that you can stay later, because there was no rules against somebody 13 years old, so I would stay later and the specialist from the New York Stock Exchange would come up and play golf. So I got started buying stocks at 13. And so it was an interesting way. And uh, so I liked the competitiveness, I liked the global marketplace, I liked everything, but we did not buy. We did not buy companies in Europe. We followed the industry until the Berlin Wall came down in November of 1989. Then we went global. Mm -hmm. Once the Berlin Wall went down, we said, okay, we can no longer just isolate ourselves to American companies. We all understood the, the connection on a global basis, but we didn't invest that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tiananmen Square occurred in July or June of 2089. I might have got the wrong year, 1989, yeah. Berlin Wall was 1989. It was yes. amazing, amazing how long it does. And as, uh, what is with Volkswagen? Do you look at that situation yes. after the scan? Yes, we bought some. You bought some? What, what is your take? How long does it take such a crisis with image and fines and to go? Well, I, I think the notion of uh, correcting in the United States, you cannot sell a car with a defect. To the degree it is an environmental defect as opposed to safety defect, you will be dealing with certain issues. They're working their way through that. I think they'll come out of it. Whether it's two years or three years, I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. So I, I'm not concerned about that. What I think Volkswagen will do is spin off the truck business. And we think the truck business will merge with Navistar in the United States. So we are buying Navistar. Navistar is a big Class A truck that had their own problem with diesel engines. They had a diesel engine that was supposed to do X. It did not do it. They did not have a backup. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, Volkswagen to us is very attractive. What we did is we made money by buying parts suppliers. So for example, if you drive a BMW, or you drive, you, you'll see the red calipers on the front. Those are made by a company in Italy called Brembo. We've made five times our money by owning Brembo because we follow the car companies. We've been following them for 50 years, so you know you always pick little spots. Like I talked about the distribution of parts, we will also look at original equipment parts produced, and occasionally we'll buy the truck manufacturers, the Class A truck manufacturers. And when you like a, a mid-sized company, how far do you go? Do you build up like five percent, ten percent, or where would you say you would stop buying when it, when you own? The ideal world for us is our clients. We have 2,000 separately managed, customized accounts. That is $20 billion, okay. we have 20, uh, $20 billion in mutual funds. Ideally, we would buy 100% of the company. Okay, but that's technically... Th the closest I came was 49%. 49. Right, and I think we own a company now that have, we own about, uh, for our clients own, 40 odd percent. It's called Sevcom, tiny company. What they did was that when you go into a factory, you could not bring in electric, you know when the operator has to move a pallet they have the forklift truck. They made all of the equipment to control the movement for the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. They took that technology and they're now being given orders by the car companies, and I don't know which ones, but I'm assuming it's either Mercedes or BMW, to provide that technology for portions of the big trucks so that the truck not only works on diesel, but when they're st idling or starting, they can have an electric uh, assist. And the stock is selling at $10, and we think if they can pull it off over the next five to 10 years, you can make 10 times your money. So we own 
a large portion of the company, but not for one client, but for a lot of clients. Are you in the board? Are you no? You have somebody from your own team in the board, or no? But no? I did. I did put someone on the board of this particular company because they they needed money, and they were reluctant to give the management the capital to grow. So as a result of that, the company went out and raised some financing, and these are very friendly deal. Um, What's a, a, a stock symbol again? SEB. SEB. And but you're not Sam Edward Victor. Sam. Okay. I I have uh, I have enough being on the board of all of my public companies, a lot of mutual funds, and yeah, and so on. But you're not very uh, like an activist investor, right? If you see no, something, no, we are we are. Yeah. If you have a four-year-old child that's riding a bicycle, they put training wheels. Yes. Sometimes existing companies will need training wheels to stay on the right path to enhance management, uh, to en enhance the returns. We own over 100 companies that we own over 5% of. So we watch these very carefully. Do you get them involved in something when they need these wheels? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, we will do that. And uh, you know whether it's Diebold, which is buying a company in Germany now, whether it is uh, a company in uh, uh, Stockholm, uh, whether it is a company in the UK, uh, in Italy, uh, it is a little more difficult in China. Um, we have not done very much in China. What is your take on CBS and Viacom? Both have the same shareholder. Yes, and they're well, struggling. Uh, what do you think? Well, they're not struggling. The companies the have their own challenge. The business is challenged. Yeah. What happened was that Mr. Sumner Redstone took control of Viacom in 1987, bought CB, uh, Paramount in 1994, took over control of CBS. Then about 10 years ago, maybe eight, he spun off CBS. So that there's a company called National Amusements that controls both companies because mm. they have the voting stock. Yeah. We own most of the of the shares and the voting stock that are not publicly that are not controlled by the family, we own half of both CBS and Viacom. So the question is, the daughter, who's 62 years old, who's uh, trained as a lawyer but also has been involved in venture capital work, would like to change the management of Viacom, and the management is not willing to be changed. So there's some concerns over. Does she have authority because her father, Sumner Redstone, who's 92 and has had a brilliant career as a movie mogul, has he given the right blessing for her to do what he's doing? And you get the United States has this legal quagmire, and they're going to slug it out in the legal courts for a long period of time, unfortunately. What See, is your recommendation? What I don't you? have any at the moment, but my, unfortunately, I'm an old school person that if you have. I bought the stock knowing that they had 80% of the vote. So either you change the structure, where if you drop below 10% of the economics, you can't control with 5% of the, you know, 10% of the economics can't control the company. Um, I think that uh, we'll see some creative uh, solutions to this in the next six months. They thought about also a merger of both companies. Because they they're thinking about a lot of things. They're, they're not thinking about it, but Wall Street is thinking about it. So. Oh, okay. And I, there are individuals or organizations perhaps thinking about the best tax efficient way to put the companies together. We're going to have to finish. Okay. Uh, one more um, quickly about banks, financials. I think you have JP Morgan, Bank of New York. And well, we like the trust banks because they are getting a piece of the revenues. So Bank of New York is particularly interesting. Stock's $35. A group of activists, Nelson Pels and Trion, have taken a position in it. So we think over the next two or three years that'll be a very attractive. The sh short-term issue is with obviously what happened with Britain is that interest rates are not going to go up, therefore the stocks have gone down 15% in the last three days. So that gives you a good buying opportunity. And my last question about um, your clients. So in a crisis, how do you deal with it? Because it's very often it's a problem psychologically, right? People get anxious and nervous. Yes, of course. How do you, they need sometimes help, right? Well, we started in 1977. So as a result of that, we've had the challenge of 1980, 1983, 
1987 was particularly uh, uninspiring with the market drop from 2700 in one day to 1700 that was a Monday then it, the following Monday was just as bad so we sent out letters to clients we call them we have a our business is two parts judgment and service and we are very good our clients know that so an instant that's why I was in the city today for a, a meeting an institutional client that has wants to give us more money but he also has let's say x dollars with us today uh they say you we you know we're in town we would like to see you we're coming in from the west coast or we come up to your connecticut office so i would go there and, and uh you know i would see clients in milan i would see them in london i would see them in florida the ones i have trouble with are the ones in asia why is that a long flight oh okay <laughs> Okay. I mean, I can, you know, it's easier go, coming back from Berlin than it is to, uh, than it is for coming back from Tokyo. Yeah. I think people pick very often a good manager, but they make themselves the mistake that they, in a terrible time, they, they can't deal they with They go it. to the cocktail party then, and they listen to people losing money, and they look at and their wives and their husbands sit down on, on uh, next Sunday and say, when we get the June 30th statement, what do we do? Half of it. And then, plus, and yeah. then now they watch CNBC in the morning, and they watch Bloomberg, and they watch whoever else is out there, and they say risk on, risk off. And so they uh, they analytically do not they sell at the wrong time and they buy at the wrong time. Yeah. And and what can you do? Nothing. Nothing. We just hold their hands, and if it's a private wealth manager, if it's institutions. Uh, they're more balanced in their approach. Right now, because fixed income has gone up and equities have gone down, we're going to get money in. We already have a client in Europe that just called us today and said we're giving you $30 million dollars because we're rebalancing the portfolio. And that we'll see more of. And appropriately, they took money out because we did so well in the first part of the year, rebalanced the other way. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your interest. Uh, if yes, you have sir. any questions, come back to me, okay? okay. And uh, I will be uh, around for a while. Thank you. Okay. Thank, go you to very much. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I know. I know. Tom, have you met? Yes, we have. We met yes. Uh, he's already yanking me for another meeting. Thank you. Thank you.